beautiful human hello. We have Demi Lovato in the studio. Woo! Thank you. Hello. This is I God's truth. I've known you for a beat now. Yeah. Uh, like in life and you've come and done our show in like the weirdest tiniest moments random <laughs> this is like the first real proper sit down and I can't thank you enough yeah. for giving us your time and energy. Oh, of course. Thanks for having me. It means a lot. Like I when you're this album is obviously different than anything else you put out because I mean for, it's a revamp version. Yeah. So, let, let let's dive in because when I listened to this thing maybe six times top to bottom, it was Thanks. both nostalgic yet present yet exactly what I needed but very I it gave honest songs a new sense of honesty and it was it's weird like it, it felt caught up with me if that makes any sense like from my first time listening to all those records and uh he did an amazing job thank Fuck. you so much how do you curate what you want to bring back to life or breathe new life into i wanted to do a kind of greatest hits album without being a greatest hits album you know and like my fans love certain songs that made the album that maybe weren't hits of mine, mm. but like are deep cuts that al that fans know. So like La La Land is one of them. It's not a hit that was on the radio, but it was a song that fans of mine who have been fans of mine for a long time know very well. Like peaked and in the fifties when it came out on billboard, but ends up becoming this cult classic that I mean, defines it. Like I know so many people are part of like, the younger side of Gen Z that feels so understood by that one record. Oh, thanks. And, and and by the way, come in contact with that song at different stages of life. In some cases, years after you released it. Right. Timeless. Thank you. Um. Yeah. And I just I wanted to make a new album that uh that reflected my new sound, but um was still reminiscent of the. 2008 2009 era of when I released it and um I think that you know I like I love how it turned out and I'm really happy with it I think that nostalgia is something that you know people millennials are really into right now and so I think that um that also played a factor into it as well what do you take with you from holy fuck that you carry with you into this revamp version outside of this overall rock metal uh, sonics. Is there anything? I would say it's mainly the sound. It's not, um, and, and also the feel, the heart to it. You know, there's a lot of heart in the new revamped songs that I released. Um, but, but sonically I wanted to, the way that this whole album came about actually was I went on tour and I was like, fuck, I have these pop songs that don't match the sound of the rest of my set list. And so I started changing songs like Sorry Not Sorry and Heart Attack into rock songs. And I was like, I really like the way these sounds. I should release them. And it turned into, well, why don't we release, or it turned into, why don't I release a whole album of these songs? So I did. What is it like to, I mean, to go back just emotionally and start tearing these songs apart? Like, what is, where, where does the process begin when you want to take something that you've already put out into the the world and make it new again? What does the process begin? Um, I took it to the producer that did, um, the producers that did Holy Fuck, um, Oak Felder and The Orphanage. And um, I w took it to them and was like, let's change these songs into rock songs. And so they started with the production and then I would go in and record it, and that's how they came about. Is the reference using the older record records, or are you only building Sonics and production off of the lyrics? No, building Sonics off of um, the new sound. And so sometimes we would have, like, an idea of what we would want the Sonics to sound like. Um, but for the most part, it was mainly the music. But there's so many little details in these records too. Like you swapped iconic parts from from the original with like a new like it's it's really beautifully done. Thank like you. Uh, okay. Cool for the summer. When you're tearing this sucker apart and you're bringing like you're you're essentially bringing new life to it, are you trying to tell a new story with the song? Kind of. And and cool for the summer, you know, the lyrics I changed from don't tell your mother to go tell your mother. It's no longer a song uh, that's, you know, 
it's more so it's proud. And, um, and I wanted that to be reflective because when I first released the song, I wasn't in a place where I was comfortable enough in my sexuality to show or to tell the world that I was, um, by at the time. And so I kind of, you know, the lyrics I think reflected where I was at emotionally, which was don't tell your mother. I was, it was kind of like a time in my life where I wasn't telling my mom or my dad that, um, I was having feelings for, um, women. And when, you know, after I came out to my parents and to the rest of the world, First of all, my parents were like, mm, yeah, listen to Cool for the Summer. We're kind of aware already. <laughs> um, and then, you know, once I came out, it was, why did I release a song with Don't Tell Your Mother? It's kind of shaming. I I want it to be proud. And so um, I changed the lyrics. And first I changed l- the lyrics on tour when I um, did the Tell Me You Love Me tour. And then um, I changed it uh in the recorded version for the revamped release. What does that feel like to be, to be able to like, like a song like that takes new understanding and new meaning and adapts to exactly who you are, where you are. And then to put that in a version that will be available forever. Is there, is it, what what is that feeling like to go back and actually change that? Yes. On stage is one thing, but now like as people, find this song for generations to come. This will be the version they stumble across. Yeah. I mean, I hope this is the version they stumble across because, you know, one, it sounds so sick. I'm really <laughs> proud of it. But two, it's more positive. And, um, and it, I'm proud of the growth that I had emotionally during the last however many years since I've released the original song. Um, and I'm proud that that's reflective in the lyrics now. It's hard to be queer. I think yeah. that's like the, the, you know, it's maybe the most dumbed down way to phrase it, <laughs> but it is, it genuinely is. And yeah. you've given honesty in situations where you didn't necessarily need to give honesty. Yeah. I'm, I'm a very honest person. I'm an open book. So like what you see is what you get. I'm not afraid to talk about anything. Um, you know, I have my boundaries, obviously, like I'm not going to spill everything, but when there are certain subjects that I think it will benefit other people, like hearing from my experience of what it's like being queer, um, I talk about it so that I can help others. Like that's really, really important to me. Um, But yeah, it is hard being queer. And um, I feel very fortunate that, that I've had so many positive experiences being queer, but at the same time it is difficult when um, people try to dissect that for me and, try to um, try to take my words and s- skew them, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, because they make them not yours. Yeah, because they're not mine anymore. Do you remember the moment it all changed where you realized that maybe not playing a character, but allowing there to be this intense wall between you and the honest you, you and the, the you that everybody got and then the you that, everybody else got that was, you know, private facing. Do you remember the day that that wall needed to come down or at least get chopped in half a little bit or was just too tiring to keep up? There was never a point in my career, I think, that I held up a character. I think from the beginning, even as like a role model on Disney Channel, um, there were certain things I weren't obviously telling the my fans and the rest of the world. Like I'm not going to go shout about underage drinking and things like that, but... I was talking about being bullied at a very young age and I was one of the first people that came out and talked about bullying. And so it, it kind of set the tone for the rest of my um, career where it was just like, what is, you know, be honest with what you're dealing with because, and what you have dealt with because it can help someone. I just always knew that. And then the first time that I ever went to treatment, I, came out and was like, I need to talk about this. This is not something that I want to hide or just shut off from the public. This is something that I want to share with my fans because I didn't have that role model growing up that I could look up to and be like, so-and-so in the public eye struggled with an eating disorder. Now I can get help for mine. It was very, it was a very tight-lipped um, 
problem that people just didn't speak about. And I know I knew that I needed to be that inspiration for someone. So I just decided to start talking about it. And then ever since then, I've just been honest and open with my journey. And it's been the best way to hold myself accountable for my actions, but also still, you know, be a role model for people. And um, I learned that being a role model isn't about being perfect. Nobody's perfect. Um, But it's about just vulnerability goes a long way with people and it can inspire others. So that's what I, you know, want to do. Did it go a long way with you? Did you ever, do you feel a sense of understanding from people being under, people feeling understood by you? Yeah. You know, it's been amazing to have fans and people who maybe aren't fans of my music come up to me and say, you've really inspired me by sharing your story, you know, you getting sober helped me look at my issues in a different light or um, now I'm able to talk about my sobriety or my my daughter, my son has an eating disorder or struggles with self-harm and because you talked about it, I can um, have a better insight into what they're dealing with and um, it's been really rewarding, really fulfilling to me to be able to speak about my experiences and have such a positive reaction. Um, At times it has felt like a burden when I was younger. I think I felt like, Oh shit. Like I talked about my sobriety when I'm maybe not secure about my sobriety at the time or wasn't secure about my sobriety at the time. And it felt like a burden, but now it doesn't feel that way because I feel so secure in where I'm at in all of my recovery. Even to say that, like, does that give you strength? Does that? Yeah, definitely. It gives me strength, but it's also a strength that I already had, you know? It's fucking incredible. Thank you. And and by managing sobriety is yeah. the most difficult, hardest thing. And by the way, sobriety is different for everybody. So it's totally. managing what that is to you. Yes. And what that means to you and those around you is the hardest thing a human being can go through. Right. It's fucking, it's insane insanely intense, insanely emotional, and also really rewarding and beautiful. And does this music, or at least this style of music, help channel any of that? I think that that's like a separate area of my life. Like, I don't really combine my sobriety and my music unless I'm talking about it in a song. Got it. Um, Happy Ending was a song on Holy Fuck that I released where I talked a bit about my struggles. Um... And Skin of My Teeth, obviously, you know, talked about addiction in there. And, um, but for this album, no, I think if if there was one song that did kind of uh, have a deeper meaning that could relate to my vulnerability and my journey with recovery, it could be Skyscraper. Yeah. Um, You know, recording that uh, was... Re-recording that was a lot of fun for me because I had sang it a million times on stage that it was actually really easy for me to do just in the studio again. Um, so it didn't take long, but it felt it felt like there was a new strength that I had recording it that I didn't have the first time. The first time I had recorded it when I was 17 and wasn't in a good place, just kind of flippantly recorded this song um, that I could belt on and, but there wasn't a lot of soul behind it. In retrospect, I think the soul that came across or translated, you know, on the recording, I think was like subconscious pain because I wasn't aware of it. And then I, I actually would, I had like an iPod (laughs) back in the days of iPods. I had an iPod touch in treatment and I would listen to that song over and over and it would actually give me faith and hope that I could get out of treatment when I was there the first time and, and come out and um, use that song as, um, as, as strength for me. And it still provides strength today. Yeah, definitely. What definitely. Is it, did, when you're able to record that and get, get into that booth, is it easy? Is it freeing? Is it, I mean, you said it was easy cause you had performed it over and over again, but you know what you're doing it for. It's different this time. Yeah. Like, is it a one like what is that process like even when it comes to vocals like how many times do you cut a record do you strategically place runs like or do you just feel it emotionally and let it go 
No, I'm a bit of a perfectionist. So I, if I have an idea for a vocal run in a certain spot, I will do it however many takes it takes to get there. Um, I would like to say that I'm the type of person that just kind of does it in one take, but I'm very specific with where I want my vibrato to land. Like I try to time it out to the tempo of the song, like so that it doesn't clash with the tempo. What does that um, evoke? What does that give you in a, in a finished product? It's just, I guess it's a little bit more polished than just singing in one take. The emotion might not be there. And so sometimes I will sing in one take and then touch it up in certain spots. But um, for the most part, and sometimes the emotion isn't, is there in certain takes that I don't love and I end up going with that take just because the emotion is there. Um, so it just, it all depends on, on what comes out of my mouth when I'm singing um, and how I want it to fit into the song. By the way, the thought of you listening to yourself on that recording, you're talking to yourself to skyscraper. You're sitting there, yeah. like you're, you're literally speaking to yourself. It's like a, that's, I mean, like, what if that song didn't cross your path? What if you didn't lend your voice to that record and it wasn't there for you during that moment on that iPod touch? Like, that's really wild. It's really wild to think, but I am a firm believer that everything happens for a oh, reason. fuck yeah. And that things happen the way they're supposed to. And I think that that song was put into my life to give me strength during that really difficult period of time in my life. And to provide it to millions of others. And then <laughs> it helped so many others and um and it's just it's really rewarding really really rewarding to have that feeling do you remember when that song took on new meaning officially like when you listened to it back for the first time in a while and you you knew it was different it felt different the first time that i listened to it back in treatment i believe i was like this is it really takes on a new meaning for me um, and then now when I listen to it, you know, it doesn't take on, um, too much of a different meaning. It's just like, it's just representing strength and, um, and yeah. Goosebumps. Because it is one of the, it's, in my opinion, one of the greatest songs of our generation by far. One Thank of the you. most beautiful, incredible ballads to Thank ever you. exist, empowering and I mean, I know, I know people it saved, like, you know, it's like one of those songs that for just tens of millions of people meant something so much. Thank you. Sky, wow. Skyscraper, that's the one you sang to the ghost, right? <laughs> yes. I believe it was an alien though, right? Or was no, it, a it was, it was, it was a ghost. ghost. Got a ghost. Yeah. Sorry. It was a ghost. I, but Why did the ghost need to hear that song? Um, it wasn't that song in particular that like had a certain meaning. It was just like the ghost wanted to hear me sing. Um, I cringe so bad looking back <laughs> at that moment. Um, but I was just like really feeling what we were doing and I was like really in the moment and I was like, I think I know what's going on here. And so, yeah. It's fucking iconic. <laughs> it <really is. laughs> it's so cringy. <laughs> is there a list of moments that you wish you could erase from the internet forever? Um, yeah, like half of my career. There's, I've done so many cringy things. That's the problem about being an artist for so long is you have so many more cringy moments. Um, like, for instance, Poot. Oh my God, yeah. Like, Happy birthday, by the way. Thank you, thank you. Poot is one of those moments where like, for the longest time, I thought that it was a bad picture of me. Like I was like, oh my God. Someone took a bad picture of me and now it's gone viral. Like that's everyone's worst nightmare to get a bad angle and for it to go so viral. And then people name it a funny name because it's so viral and so bad. And then I saw somewhere where someone had put the original image next to the Photoshopped one. Yeah. And I was like, oh, someone Photoshopped that shit. Oh. But I believed for the longest time 
You and most was, of the internet, I think. That it was a bad angle of me. God, that's and, fucked. And I was like so mortified. <laughs> I never but, knew that was photoshopped. Yes, it was photoshopped because I saw the regular image next to the photoshopped one and I was like, oh, okay, it's not that bad. But like, I it was really blown out from the lighting. It was... Um, I think they stretched out my jaw or something or my chin or something and like my eyes or something like that. Anyways, um, for the longest time, I was so mortified. And then I finally was like, you know what? Fuck it. It's going to live on the internet forever. I might as well embrace it. So I have embraced it. I like posted a TikTok on my birthday. That was uh, my assistant got me poot uh, (laughs) Oreos, like chocolate covered Oreos with poot's face on them. And I was like. I obviously have to post this. I just love that it has its own name and has its own everything. It has its own life. It has its own backstory. Like people are like free Poot. Poot lives in Demi's basement and she only lets her out once a year or something like that. Like it's so ridiculous. But um, but that one I have fun with. So you were genuinely abducted by aliens? No, I don't think I was abducted. I think that something weird happened to me where I don't know if I was like, I don't know if I was... Um, astral projecting or like, I, I'm not really sure what happened, but I was like, I was sleeping and I just had this really, really vivid, realistic dream. And that's what it, that's all it was. But you gave consent, right? That's why. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cause in there I was like, they were like, do you want to go see our home planet? I was like, fuck yeah, I do. what they look like? Um, they were just like shadowy figures. It was Big, like three little, of them. Three? No, they were like, they were probably like normal human size. God. And yeah, I think it was just a dream though. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I don't think it was anything more than that. You, you believe in aliens? Yes. Me too, yeah. Yeah, big, of course. Big, big, big. Yeah, you're big Yeah, I'm it. really you big into it. You show, didn't you? On Peacock? Yeah, unidentified. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So like, okay. Obviously, we we know that like they exist. We know that yes. they could be very large in size. Uh, we know that they have them apparently. Yes, and we keep hearing mixed uh, the things like. Yes, I heard there was a report the other day that these things could be really big or really small depending on the gravitational pull and what's oh, going interesting. on. Yeah. Well, also you have to think about it. it th- I don't think there's just like one blanket type of alien. We live 100%. in. Look at the universe we live in. Yeah. Like, there's got to be all different walks of life in this universe. Um, so I think they're big. I think they're small. I think they're good. I think they're bad. I, I, you know, I just, who knows? Like we don't have all the answers. So who knows? Do you believe that we're on the cusp of potentially having a facilitated meeting between us and aliens? Oof. I don't know. I mean, maybe we've already had that meeting. Like, who's to say that we haven't already had them and we just don't know because we're in the public hey, right. and not in the government? No, and who within the government is designated as, like, the, you know, uh, the ambassador to the aliens? Like, who's communicating? Who's talking? Like, Well, I think it was Eisenhower that supposedly had a meeting. Or it was someone, it was another president that 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 had, supposedly had a meeting with um, aliens. And I'd have to like go back and and research it. I wish I could just like, I wish I had this wealth of knowledge that I could just like whip out facts. It was Eisenhower. It was Eisenhower? Okay, yeah. So I do have that wealth of knowledge. (laughs) 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 But um, supposedly, yeah, that happened. And who's to say it didn't? I, I believe. Yeah, I believe. I really do. I do think that there's aliens out there. And I think uh, when the time is right, Uh, it's going to be a big thing. It's going to be a big thing. I think it could like... I think it's really, um, it's a, it's a tricky thing to announce to the public because so many people, uh, are going to flip their shit. Oh, totally. People who don't believe and that believe in God Mm -hmm. are going to be like, how can both things coexist? I I think both things can coexist, but some people are going to really spin out. Oh, I think they can both coexist. I think science and religion have more in common than people think. Me too. I don't think it's one or the other. I 100%. think it's both. Oh, I think it, I think at the end of the day, like science, universe, collective energy, they're all very, very similar. Yeah. In, in, in what religion is at like its core, right? Yeah. I mean, for me personally, like I am more of a believer of a source mm-hmm. and the universe. Yes. Um, I'm that not, is religion essentially. Yes. Um, it's, yeah, it's all like semantics, right? Like yeah. it's 
different for different people. Cool. Um, I used to believe in a father and a God and I just, just don't, I kind of, I just don't anymore. Um, my version of God changed and now I believe it in source. Totally. Um, I believe that something created us, but I don't know what. And I don't think it's a man with a white beard, you know, <laughs> um, not to say that whoever does believe in that is wrong. Like I don't have the answers to the universe. So who knows? But um, that's just me personally. And by the way, a part of the fun is that like nobody really knows or nobody yes. has all the answers to the universe. Yes. But if you look at it and collective power, call it the universe, call it a source, call it a God. Yes. You know, yeah, like each religion is littered with its own stuff. And yes. a lot of those things in a lot of cases could be really mean to different groups of people. Yeah. And create division and create hierarchy of power structures and a whole bunch of stuff. But all So of, then you announce aliens and it just all crumbles. But that's it. And and I do believe <laughs> that they're gonna announce aliens when they need a distraction. So like right. shit's gonna be going down to your left and they're gonna be like, Hey, fuckers, look over here. And then we're all gonna be looking right, meeting right. aliens. Who knows what's going down on the left? Well, it was like when, you know, everything was going on and they released in 2020 footage from the Pentagon. The, oh the Pentagon released footage from aircrafts um and they saw the, in the military that had footage, yeah, of the UFOs, UFOs or yeah. UAPs. Um, and so and nobody really paid attention to it because it was You had other things going on. Yeah, there were so much other things going on, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I kind of, I'm with you on that one. It's real. Yeah. It's real. Do I you, believe it's real. Do you remember when your thoughts on religion changed? Because I grew up very religious. I went to Catholic school, was an altar boy, really believed in it. I genuinely did. Um, I started reading the Bible and started seeing how people who perpetuate or, you know, spread the gospel really carry themselves. I'm like, oh, this is not what Jesus would have wanted at all. Yeah. I think when I got older, um, I started looking back on my childhood I grew up um Christian and um like half of my family was Pentecostal too That's... um and like on my mom's side of the family they were Pentecostal and so I grew up around that um at a certain age and went to church all the time and then I started seeing behaviors of people from the church I went to that were really problematic and it kind of skewed my my idea of what um it just changed things for me you know i i had like a, a negative experience that um that i won't forget and it i kind of always correlated that to the church and um so things changed for me and then when i got older you know i started I came out and I started realizing like that I didn't like what I was seeing in the behavior of, of certain people. That's not to say that like there are people who are religious that are but like all bad people. It, that's not yeah. the case at all. There are good and bad everywhere, but I just was seeing kind of the negative side of it and um, started to dissect what some of the things in the Bible were saying, like um, that I didn't agree with. And so and so, yeah, things changed for me. And then I started expanding my consciousness with meditating in the desert and making contact with ETs. And I was like, <laughs> you know, like actually seeing things appear in the sky after meditating and realizing like this world is really incredible and this universe is huge. And I don't believe we're the only life form out there. And so that kind of influenced my path as well my spiritual path um do I sometimes I believe that the things that have shown up for me in bright lights aren't necessarily aliens but they could be angels totally you know like it's just I don't have like one definitive pathway in my spirituality it's just I believe that some things I believe that things can coexist and I, and I have no idea what is out there. Like I'm, I'm no longer in um, the mindset of that. I have all the answers from a book. Mm. By the way. Yeah. And, and your pathway that you're paving is built on experience and your honesty and your truths and exactly how you 
internalize and take in what you see and hear around you mm -hmm. and your own experiences with it. Totally mm -hmm. get that. Yeah. It, it is wild. Like, you know, when you see people that maybe you see, saw as hero is the wrong word, but like uh, hierarchy or w somebody in power. Somebody Authority. Like, yes. And you see, you see that connection to religion and what, what that is and what that could be. It's like really does ruin, it doesn't ruin it for you, but it makes you question. It makes you question for sure. Exactly. And I think that's what I'm getting at too, is it's like, um, there are people that are in authority that, that are of high authority in, in the church that are great people. And there are some that, you know, are, have, have faults just like every other human. And, um, I think, I think what changed for me is like the shame. There was a lot of shame that came from, uh, the church and my religion that I, you know, had, had experienced. And, um, I didn't think that my God, the one that I believe in, not the one that I read about in a book, but my God, I don't think that he would judge me for, he or she would judge me for, um, or they, you yeah. know, it doesn't, I don't even know what my God looks like, but, um, cause I just see it as like this universal power. Um, I don't think that that would, they would judge me for being queer for loving everyone, um, for being myself, you know? I think that that, that God would be... We're getting really deep right now. <laughs> I, think that, I think that my God would love me and accept me as I am. As they should and they would. And by the way, this is... Whoever needs to hear that and understand that is like, you are not alone. And yeah, what you believe in and mm -hmm. what you look up to and what you give mental energy, time, physical energy, all of it to mm -hmm. should love and accept you for exactly who you are and what you bring to this world, not what their idealized version of you is. Right. And uh, yeah, it's so easy to get lost in that. Really, really is. I think what's important is that if you are worshiping something, make sure that it loves you back for who you are. That is the truth. Yeah. When, holy fuck. Do you make this body of work for you or for others? Oh, I made that for me. I made that for me. You know, diving into rock music again was something that I was excited to do that um, I hadn't done in a long time. And I knew that it wouldn't have the same, you know, rock music isn't on top of the charts. I knew that it wasn't going to have the same commercial success that maybe Sorry Not Sorry had. Um, so I didn't, I wasn't putting out music to top the charts. I was putting out music that felt right and authentic to me. I had a lot of anger that I hadn't released um, in my music. Um, I had a lot of I had a lot of stuff that I wanted to talk about that was very vulnerable. And, and so I, yeah, I made that for me. I didn't make it for anyone else, but I'm, if it reached, I always said like, if I'm making this for me, but if it reaches people, I'm so glad that it did. How beautiful though, is it to, because uh, and before Holy Fuck, do you feel like you were making those past records and those past albums for you? I mean, you can make the case that you made Skyscraper just for you. Yeah. And it was I mean, needed just for you. I think it's hard when you're, I got signed to a record label at 15. Yeah. So I've been in this for a long time. And I think that there have been times where I've made music just to keep going because I didn't want to lose relevancy. I think there have been times where I relied on my music that I'm releasing as like a part of my recovery. Like Holy Fuck was a part of my recovery. You know, I got to talk about things, like I said, happy endings, skin of my teeth, like those songs mean so much to me um, because they were reflective of where I was at. And if I didn't put out that music, it would just fester inside of me. Would, would you be skipping a stage of your recovery by not releasing that music or making it? No, I think my recovery would have stayed the same, but it just did. I benefited more by releasing it, by writing and releasing it. Um, there is something therapeutic about that. Oh, it's so therapeutic. And I think there have been times where I've, made music just to make music because I thought that's what I was supposed to do. I think there've been times where like, you know, being on stage and leotards and stilettos, like I just released music and songs that, 
and toured because that's what I was supposed to do. I put on these stilettos and these leotards because I thought that's what I was supposed to do. Like I just, it's hard when you've been in the industry for so long since you were a kid, you're afraid of, you know, I was, I've been afraid of losing relevancy at times. And, um, and so it's been, yeah, I think at times it's been challenging at at other times it's felt really effortless um, and holy fuck felt very effortless to me. What fuels your fear of losing relevance? Because I can make the case any day of the week that Demi Lovato for a long time has been rather timeless. And Thank you. Yeah, sis, like, you know, like, people care. Like, they really do. And they talk instantly about you. Blessing and a curse, I think, yeah. on both sides of it. Yeah. But, like, what really fuels your fear of losing relevance? Because from the outside looking in... It, you know, I may, I clearly don't see it, but Thank you, you never know. I think that relevancy is subjective. Totally. I think everyone has their own version of like who's important to them and who's hot to talk about. And then other people will be like, yeah, but I listen to bands from the 70s and 80s and they're relevant to me. I don't know who such and such is that's topping the chart right now. You know what I mean? I think it's subjective. And so... But I think that it all stems from being a child star. I wanted to explore why I still have this fear of not having public validation. And it's because I've been in this game for so long and I was conditioned and programmed as a child to rely on public validation and outside validation. Um, You know... When you release a project, um, whether it's an album or a TV show, you want people to like it so badly. And it's because I was conditioned to think that way from a young age. I wasn't patted on the shoulder after, a, you know, like playing a soccer game and saying, good job. It was like I was rewarded by awards and chart places on the charts and that came with a lot of responsibility and I want to like do a deeper dive into why I am the way I am, why I've been, how I've been programmed and like how I can escape that. Um, Cause I would love to like, I have gotten a lot better about that. Like I don't rely on it as much. I also know that my happiness isn't reliant on what the public thinks of me. There've been times where like I've been destroyed in the press and there have been times where I've been celebrated and I have to like, I have to understand, I have to stay grounded in where I'm at because what matters to me is my friends, my family, and like my internal happiness that I don't have to share with everyone if I don't want to. Um, I also, I, like another thing that I don't do is like, I read comments to respond to fans, but I don't read comments to seek validation anymore um I used to post a picture and then see what everyone said about me because I wanted to feel beautiful you craved it I craved it and if I saw a negative comment it would destroy me if I saw a positive comment it wasn't really sinking in because I didn't believe it and you know inherently so I learned that by reading comments um I only do it to respond to fans. And the second I see something, if, if my ego is, because either way, like if you're reading comments, positive or negative, it's just feeding your ego. Totally. And totally. so I just, yeah, I, I only read them to respond to fans by saying like, love you. Thank you. Um, but other than that, like I don't seek that anymore. Did you realize when you were a kid, how heavy the baggage that how heavy the baggage was that you were carrying or not forced to carry. It was your job to wheel around. Like, did you realize how, how big and heavy and what size of responsibility it was? No, when I, and I don't think that my family did either. Like we got into the industry when I was, I was on Barney and friends when I was seven or eight years old. And I didn't know, but that by making certain decisions in my childhood, it would set me up for the rest of my life. I'm grateful that I did. Um, I'm not saying that I am not grateful at all, but it did come with a lot of uh, pressure. And 
I've had to learn how to navigate that as gracefully as I can without letting it affect my mental health. But at times I have let the pressure get to me and rightfully so you're human. I, and I'm, yeah, I'm human. I'm fallible. So, um, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm not, I'm not perfect. And I, it's gotten to me at times, but had I known that I would have been in this, that it, that it, it would have come with so much pressure. Um, I probably still would have done it because I, I love my life today. Um, but yeah, <laughs> that was a long-winded answer. No, Sorry. never. It is, it is a double-edged sword. It's a blessing and a curse. It's, yeah. it's everything. Because at the same time, what's given you so much, what's given your family so much, what's given everybody in your life that's close to you so much has also created a bunch of shit mm -hmm. and made it really hard to just be normal. But everything you said earlier is easier said than done. Like realizing that your happiness is determined by you and not by any sort of outside factors. That's so... Even people on the smallest scale posting photos to Instagram to seek likes and validation because that's what mm -hmm. they put their worth into as a human being. And we're posting a TikTok with the yes. hopes that it goes viral. And and their hopes, their dreams, their 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 day to day is just beholden to the amount of likes or comments that something gets or yes. the amount of views it gets. Well they're, now sorry. No, they're destroyed by the algorithm. They're held back yes. by the algorithm. Well, now we're all being programmed yes. to seek public and outside validation. Yeah. And it's so damaging to young minds um, because they're going to grow up craving that for the rest of their lives. And how will that affect their personal relationships in oh, me the future? I, we, we've seen more one hit wonders since mm -hmm. the year 2019 to now than we've seen in decades. Well, the industry has changed completely. Totally. Which is terrifying. I mean, you release a massive hit song and it'll stay on the chart for a week or two and then it'll disappear because no one has the attention span to like, or is nobody really cherishes music the way that they used to. So. Um, used to, you'd hold on to a song for like, if I, and I'm, I'm at fault for this too. Like I make a playlist of my favorite songs once a month, once every two months, it's which really I think is like, still a long time to sit with music in this day and age. Um, but yeah, it's just, we're, we're, nobody really sits with music anymore. Things would chart for so long and some songs still do, but those are like, like those are so abnormal yeah. to, to accomplish, you know, to and get those. It's really hard. You, well, first of all, like, by the way, to get a song to chart, to get a song to stay on the charts, and then to, yes. to, to follow up a song that hits really high. Yes. Very rare. Because yes. people can have all the success, whether it be at radio or on Billboard or whatever, and then they don't have a follow-up because, yes. like, they didn't even really know that they were going to get here to begin with. Yes. What I do kind of like is that we're not following a formula totally. anymore. And this, the, yeah, by the way, formula... First thing that comes to mind in Sonics, I think like what it means to be pop is becoming a yeah. more broader term. Totally. I mean, you look at the top 10 right now on Billboard, there's country, uh, there's, you know, there's pop, there's hip hop, there's, there's, dance. there's, there's dance, there's... The number one song on the charts is that guy that went viral the other day. Yeah. Rich man. Uh, rich man of rich, rich man of Mid uh, Richmond, Jesus. Have rich you heard man of this guy? north of Richmond by no. Oliver oh, Anthony Music. It's fucking crazy. This guy yeah. went viral from a video, and now he has the number one song on Billboard. I mean, and and that's what's that's what's <laughs> fun, and that's what's scary uh. is like the formula. And for me, I grew up in the day and age where like you were getting ready to release an album, you'd have a single, and then you'd test it at radio to see how it did. Now nobody tests at radio anymore. No, they test um, everywhere but They radio. test on TikTok. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. how they test songs. <laughs> um, and so it's like, it's uncharted territory. And I'm coming from, you know, an era of music that's, that didn't grow up with TikTok, that didn't grow up with releasing songs on the internet first. So it's like, I don't know, it's, it's uncharted territory and, and I, and it's scary at times, but it's also like fun because cool for the summer when it re had a resurgence uh, last year, it entered like the global top fifty on Spotify yeah. again, and I'm like, this is a almost ten year old song. Like, 
and by the way, I do think that there's something with the two eras lining up, right? Like we're, we're, we're in the middle of a music era where democratization of the medium and the industry is so like we've never seen before. Anything yeah. has the ability to catch ears, but you're also entering into, you, you've been into an era with Holy Fuck and going into revamp where you're, you're, you're living this honest sound. And I do believe that these songs from revamp have the ability to go viral on TikTok instantly they're catchy as fuck Thanks. they're iconic they're nostalgic but yet they're new and they're fresh and they're so different and like the, the the because of where we're at and there being no definition to what can go viral and what can pop and what can make the charts and you having to make music that is not necessarily what you used to sound like mm -hmm. i mean it is what you sound like but you get what i'm saying it's more yeah holy fuck is metal is it fair to say <laughs> it's metal I wouldn't say it's metal, but I, feel I like would the metal say it's more rock. Would hate, hate on me for saying that it's metal. I feel like metalheads, you could get into trouble with metalheads <laughs> for saying that for sure. Bring it on, motherfuckers. <laughs> Bring it on. But the, different, a departure. And yeah. these revamped sound so unlike the original that, Thanks. like, they sound so different that it, it needs a platform like TikTok and the internet yeah. to breathe this whole new fucking life into it. Yeah. Honestly, I think it's like perfectly aligned. Thank you. I love the little scream and sorry, not sorry. Yeah, we changed that from the wait a minute yeah. to the, to the to scream. A scream. Was that you? No, I can't scream to save my life. <laughs> I wish I could, but it also would probably damage my vocals, True. my vocal cords. So I'm, I'm on one hand, I'm like grateful that I can't scream. On the other hand, I'm like, oh, it would be so sick, but. There is a note in confident that I saw the internet was talking about when you released it. At the very end, it's like, I don't know notes. It's like C sharp major six or something. It's pretty high up there. I don't yeah. even know what note it is. I just do it. <laughs> like I literally just go into the studio and I'm like, Oak is always like, okay, it's time for an ad lib pass. And I'm like, all right, get put your seatbelt on. Like, let's go. And so I'll go in there and I'll attempt high notes. Sometimes that I really don't get. Um, other times, you know, obviously they make it onto the track, um, that I'm really proud of. And that one I was proud of for sure. But when you hit a note that high, are you thinking, oh no, I have to do this during a live show one day? Yes and no. Um, I take it like show by show. Okay. So sometimes, um, like I probably won't hit the, the high note and confident every night, every night or yeah. definitely not every night. And I probably won't hit it on my next show. Mm hmm um, just because I start the show off with confident and my voice takes a second to warm up. Yeah. So to like go straight for that note is pretty ballsy <laughs> that, and those are balls that I don't have. <laughs> um, but I just like, I don't know. I, I take it show by show because sometimes like the last show that I did, I think was the 4th of July show that I did. And that one, I went for some, some of the high notes that I did on revamped just because I was feeling myself mm -hmm. and my voice felt warm and I was like, and the environment was great. Like it was humid outside, which was great for my voice. And I was like, I'm just going to go for it. So I did. So we'll see. You never know what you're going to get. But I have had like one time at a show, there's this note in a song City of Angels on Holy Fuck. At the end of the song, I go up to this really high note and this guy, I was watching, I can see the audience, obviously. <laughs> and the, the, the crowd was lit up and... I saw this guy like bracing for the note was like city of angels. And he like did this and I didn't go for that note. <laughs> and he goes oh. like that. And I was like, fuck, like are people like sad if I don't hit the highest high notes during my live shows? It was such a bummer. But I, I ultimately was like, you know what? I'm just going to do me. So. Well, by the way, that's a part of having live vocals, right? Like you yes. can go the other route. And you can literally mix in a combination of live and so, some thick ass yes. tracks and you can rely on those tracks in those moments, do a little signal to yes. the fucking booth. We know how, I know how it works. Yeah. But you don't do that. No, I true. just, I, ever since I started was just like, I'm not going to use tracks. And I think I'm like, there's times where I've definitely needed to use tracks. Yeah. Like I've been sick with bronchitis and my voice is shot. But for me, like I'd rather just postpone the show uh, than use tracks or I'd rather just skip the high notes in general. It. You can mold the performance and you still give them something it. great. Exactly. Because when people come to your live shows, they're not always there to hear the highest high notes. They're there to see you in person and to get to experience your music together. Totally. So if you're using tracks, like are you really, 
I don't know. Are you really experiencing music together or are you just listening to the album? That's it. You know? Speaking of the uh, live show, Give Your Heart a Break, you weren't performing that for a while, were you? No, I stopped performing that. And um, I recently brought it back in my most recent show. Mm -hmm. And because I was doing a show, um, it was like a 4th of July festival kind of. The one in um, Philly? Yeah, the one yeah. in Philly. Um, it was one where like I knew playing a lot of deep cuts wouldn't translate to the audience because they were families and, you know, uh, people who may not listen to my music but just know my hits. So I was like, why don't we plug them back in for the show? And, then I perf and also I was doing it for revamped. Yeah. I have it on revamped. And so um, I was like, let's plug them back in. And it was so fun to perform. Um, I think I just like, I rotate songs out of my set list in and out because some of them get tiring. And I think I got sick of performing that one for a while. Yeah. Um, also the, the older production on it just, you know, was just older. It mm -hmm. didn't really resonate anymore. So doing revamped really brought that one back out. Um, it's interesting. Like the, you're right. The production on that, like it is a timeless record, but it does, there's a dated sound to it. Yep. That is very much of the era, but the lyrics are fucking forever. Oh, thanks. Like you can dress that song up a thousand different ways to Sunday. You probably sound amazing. Just strip back with nothing. Yeah. I haven't tried that actually, but maybe I should. That fuck. That's wild. I didn't even really think about that. That production is really so much of the time it was released. Yes, totally. But yet it's still timeless as fuck. Thank you. It's really cool. Uh, don't forget, does this song take new meaning, take on any new meaning to you, or does it still stay the same as the first time you Um, I think when I wrote it, I wrote it about someone, and I definitely don't feel that way anymore because I was 16 or oh. fif 15 when I wrote it. Um, <laughs> You've lived a couple lives since then. I've lived a couple lives <laughs> since then. And so um, I don't really have anybody in particular that, like, I think about now when I write it because I'm or when I sing it because I'm in an amazing relationship and I'm not thinking about heartbreak anymore. Um, but I just try to pull from like sad emotions, you know, just try. And, and sometimes I don't get sad when I'm performing it. I just feel the vibe of the song and that's what comes out. So is there a song of yours that surprised you in its impact on people or its reach I think that skin of my teeth really surprised me. Um, I think that people would hold up posters in my in the audience and be like, "I have you know X amount of days sober, and this song really means a lot to me." And um, that's what I was hoping for. But um, like, I I would see people also in my audience that were like in their fifties and sixties, like singing every lyric to that song. And I'm sure they could relate to it, which is why they were singing every word. But like that song really surprised me because it wasn't just my core fans that were, you know, singing every word on tour. I definitely experienced like a wide variety of people, um, relating and singing that song. So I would say that one surprised me, but are you talking about from revamped? Could be anything. Yeah. I would say it's skin of my teeth really yeah. surprised me. That's it's like, yeah, to see that, like that tangible, a tangible impact, you know, like yeah. it's what you hope for, but to see it and to feel it and like for it to be in front of your eyes while you're bringing that song to life is. Yeah, it's definitely. By the way, all of Demi's music is sitting on Amazon music, just waiting for you. You can listen to Holy <laughs> Fuck, you can listen to Revamp, you can listen to all of it. It's just chilling. There's a link in the description below. Are the 10 songs on Revamp the only 10 you worked on or are there others that you had to cut? There were others that I had to cut. Like what? Um, I think I did Get Back. Um, I think I did uh, Really Don't Care. Really Don't Care was one that I had to cut that I was really bummed about. But like for some reason we just agreed upon 10 songs. So then I had to cut them down um, and or cut the the album listing down to 10 and these were the 10 that I felt would be the best for revamped. So I'm happy with what we came out with, but yeah, there's, there might, maybe a, who knows, maybe a deluxe version mm -hmm. or something. Sick. A yeah. target exclusive. <laughs> maybe. Did you get Cher Lloyd for that? Really don't care. The, the updated version. No, I oh, didn't. Um, I think okay. we were like 
playing on. She's on the original. Yeah, she is on <laughs> the original. Um, I don't really know what we did there. I think maybe that was one of the reasons why um, it mm. didn't make it because we didn't know what to do in that section. But how? F- I mean, just pretty cool. Pretty cool to just give like whole new meaning and new life to records that are iconic for everybody, but also mean the most to you. It's Thank sick. you. It's just a. I don't know. It's a really cool way to. You know, why do a greatest hits when you can do this? Yeah, for sure. It's like rewriting memories a little bit, you know? Yeah, definitely. It's fucking cool. Uh, Thank you. Listen to it. Link in the description. I have one last question. Now that you've been making rock for a bit now, do you miss anything about making pop music? I do. I mean, I'm a I'm a lover of all types of music. Um, that's why my career has been kind of, my music career has had so many different flavors to it. Mm-hmm. Um, so... I mean, you never know what the future holds. Like, I'm not going to sit here and say I'm going to stick with rock forever. I'm not going to sit here and say that I'm going to go back to pop um, or R&B or whatever it is. Like, I genuinely don't know. I'm such a fluid person that um, in every sense of the word um, that I don't know what the future holds. But, um, but yeah, I there are elements of pop that I miss for sure. Are you thinking about original stuff right now? New music, anything? I'm always thinking about original music. Like, I'm pretty much always inspired creatively. Um, When it comes to lyrics, like, I'm always writing in my phone concepts of songs that I, of ideas that I have. Um, When I listen to music, like, I'm always kind of like, okay, what should my next sound be? Um... But so, yeah, I'm thinking of original music. Are you finding inspiration from being in love? Yes, of course. Like being in love is and especially falling in love. Like there's so much inspiration there. Um, It's hard. I will say it's hard to write an album. A a happy rock album. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Like a, a rock album full of like happy love songs. That that is challenging. Can you define, uh, describe what it is to feel, like be in love or know that you're in love with someone? I think that the way that I know I'm in love is we just feel like I feel very seen and very experienced. Like I feel like this person really truly loves me for who I am and I feel the same exact way. Like I could... You know, I can be naked and feel beautiful. I can wake up first thing in the morning and have bad breath and still feel loved. Like, and the same goes for my partner. And, um, and the, the best thing about my relationship today, I would say is how much we laugh. We just laugh constantly about sometimes the stupidest stuff. Like, and I'm able to be like, I'm actually a very weird person. Like I, I can get really weird, like just making weird noises and funny voices and just funny faces and just like, I can get very weird. And when I'm with Jordan, I feel like, like we can be weird together and that nothing else in this world exists, but us, um, it's just like, it's so rewarding and so fulfilling and um I feel like he completes me and that's to me what it feels like to be in love needed that that's love yeah that's really special yeah totally that's really really special totally got me sweating like in a good way though oh thank (laughs) you no love is uh love is real I'm figuring it out in my life it's interesting it's different it's new but uh, is this love different than the ones you've had before you thought for you sure felt before? there's no there's n- never been an experience where I felt like I'm I'm really growing with the person who fully accepts me and that I f- like feel so attracted to and just feel so um like it feels like a like a genuine partnership yeah you know and that I think I've never had before well, I know I've never had before. That, that's how you know. 
Yeah, definitely. I'm sending you both all the love and luck, Thank but also you. the biggest blessings. Thank you so much. Yeah. God, love is so amazing and so special. Yeah. Listen to Revamped. Listen to it. There's you'll like this, love it. Yeah, you'll love it. <laughs> and let us know if you fall in love with it. Let us know. Let me, let, detail the emotions in the, the comment section below. Uh, but seriously, listen to Revamped and all of Demi's music. It's waiting for you. Final thoughts? Demi's got to go. Oh, my God. Get, uh, get <laughs> out of here in the best way. I really appreciate you with every fiber of my being. Thank you for thank giving us you time Thank you so much. You're incredible. Oh, thank you. You guys are wonderful. Demi Lovato, everybody. Woo.